A robot security guard that uses two television cameras for eyes stalks its way around the offices of the Californian company which designed it. But this clever piece of insect-like engineering is intended for use in more hazardous places than this. Mining, uh, nuclear power plants, uh, um, utilities, law enforcement, uh, firefighting, I could go on. There's actually uh, 13 different commercial areas that we have pinpointed. And of course, there's the whole space program. We've had some very interesting discussions with NASA for using this type of, uh, actually, we call it a space spider for building space stations. And then uh, the Department of Defense is a uh, very big uh, potential customer. From an engineering standpoint, uh, the machine is, is quite complex in the sense that we have an interaction here of computers and mechanisms and electronics. Uh, we actually have seven microprocessors on board, one for each leg, and one is a command and control. The operator just has to move a joystick and say, go in this direction, and the further over the joystick goes, the faster it goes. Everything else is being computed on board. It's not difficult to imagine how it could be maneuvered into place to get a good look at something dangerous, like a suspected terrorist car bomb. But suppose the car needs to be moved without endangering human life. It's often important to be able to move things remotely in dangerous situations. The real skill, positioning the robot accurately and understanding what's going on is being done by a human operator. But the robot can do what he can't do, and it can go where he can't go. And that, after all, is why this extraordinary device was made. I think I would like to point out that as complex as it is from an engineering standpoint, compared to a human being, uh, it's not complex at all. In fact, if you work on a program like this, you're in awe of man and woman. Uh, for you to, uh, to get up and walk across the room, the, the, the combination of your vision, your balance, and a thousand muscles is much more complex than anything that we're doing over here. Well, that system is really very clever, but its limitations show how far we are from so-called intelligent robots being able to match human performance, except in very specialized circumstances. One push, and it would fall over and be unable to get back up. Its batteries would need recharging, and it would have to be very clever indeed to figure out how to do that. And the visual system on its head was simple television cameras producing pictures that could only be interpreted in that model by a human to make any real sense. But in a more limited environment, computers are being used to analyze those pictures and make decisions depending on what they see. We found one in use at a factory in America. These are steam turbine blades, and they have to be made to a very high degree of accuracy. To help achieve this, the Westinghouse Group has installed a new robotic forging plant in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The unusual thing about this plant is that there are a number of robots working cooperatively under the control of a single computer. The same computer controls the heat treatment of billets of stainless steel before each one is transferred to a forge. The computer instructs the forge to twist and hammer it into a shape that can be easily turned into a precision turbine blade.
Meanwhile, the first robot is loading another billet of steel into the furnace. Once it's been forged, the blade is passed to a machine which stamps it with an identification number. This also has its own control system, working under the supervision of the central computer. The most advanced part of the plant is the optical gauging system. A black and white television camera looks at the blade against a bright light. As the blade rotates, the computer builds up a picture which it then compares with the one contained in memory. If the forge has made any mistakes, the two pictures will be different and instructions can be fed back to the forge to make the next blade correctly. Using the vision system, all the blades can be manufactured within very narrow tolerance limits. When Henry Ford developed the Model T, his policy was that you could have any colour as long as it was black. The Model T was the first car made on a production line, and at that time it was much easier to produce just one model in one colour. Today, 75% of all manufactured goods are made in small batches, and this gives a real problem in reducing the time taken from the start of production to the completion of the finished product. The delays are caused by batches of different products being held up waiting to be processed by the same machine tool. Reducing these delays is the aim of one system we recently went to see. The SCAMP flexible manufacturing system in Colchester is a prototype for an advanced batch production line of the future. Here, delays and queuing can be cut to a minimum, and investment in stock for work in progress minimised as a result. This is a system designed to reduce the time taken between the raw material like this and the final finished product, a cogwheel like this, with a minimum of human intervention. This system is completely computer controlled. A series of advanced machine tools, many of them with their own computer inside them, are controlled by a central computer. The parts are loaded onto this conveyor belt and their progress from machine tool to machine tool is again tracked by the same machine. Happily, human beings are required and they're summoned by a red light. In this case, it's saying seven more pallets are required. The pallets, the raw materials, are loaded onto the conveyor by hand. That part hasn't been mechanised. This is a flexible manufacturing system, and the clever part of it is that the computer can be programmed to produce a wide range of products at the same time, varying from quite a complex cogwheel like this to a spline shaft like that. Under computer control, the average time taken to complete an order is reduced from a typical three months to as little as three days. Fast turnaround gives a company a real advantage over its competitors. Well, it all looks complicated, but if you break it down into its individual components, it's really rather straightforward. Each pallet has an individual number in a 10-position binary code, which gives 1,028 different pallets that can be used. As the pallet passes in front of the sensing station, the code is read and fed into the computer, so that at any instant of time, the computer knows the location of any pallet that's on the track. Once the pallets are on the conveyor, they're passed from one tool to another so that the various manufacturing stages can be carried out in the most efficient way. The central computer constantly monitors the work in progress and sends instructions to the conveyor and each machine tool in turn. Computer control allows flexible rescheduling at any time and urgent new work can be slotted into the production line ahead of less important jobs. This is the central computer, or rather more accurately, it's two mini-computers. Just in case one breaks down, it won't bring the line to a standstill. And here are the control terminals. On this one here, the representation here is of each of the machine tools, and across here is time. That's one week of 40 hours, another week of 40 hours, and so on. It's a real-time system, so that every 10 seconds it's updated, and these jobs that are in progress will move along. The white here represents the jobs that are actually being worked on by the machines at this moment. 
Now, if I want to find out what's happening to all these machines on the line, I can look at that, and the computer will give me a display. The green ones here say they're operational, everything's fine. There's a red one here that's flashing, that needs inspection, which means it's coming up for the components to be regularly inspected to see if everything's OK. There's a problem here on a robot that needs looking at. And this blue sign here means that the machine tool and the robot are being taught to manufacture a new component. The engineer uses a teaching pendant to program each robot with a sequence of actions. The central computer stores the sequence and can send it to the robot whenever that component is to be made. The microcomputers controlling these machines receive their program of instructions from the central computer. The robots simply take the components from the conveyor and place them in the machine. They know what to expect, again from instructions from that central computer. Since most of those components are symmetrical, it's fairly straightforward. The problem arises when you have to deal with an asymmetrical component, something like this. The robot has to recognize it and position it in the appropriate position on the tool. That's what this machine's doing. The component is placed on a turntable underneath a camera, and this provides the input to a vision system. The part is rotated until the system recognizes a pre-programmed feature. The turntable then stops and the component is picked up, properly aligned for putting it into the machine tool. Well, this is the part that was made on that machine and it really is quite irregular. Ian, what are the principles behind a computer being able to recognize a television picture of an irregular shape like this? Well, Mac, as we've seen throughout the series, it's really quite easy for the computer to take a reading from a particular sensor, say temperature, and tell whether an object is hot or cold. The difficulty comes when we have a number of sensors or we take lots of readings from one sensor and then the computer has to try and analyse those results and make sense of what uh, the information is that it's getting in. Now, for humans, that's very easy. We have several sensors, we've got um, sight, we've got hearing, we've got touch, and for us it's very easy to recognise objects. Um, let me show you uh, how the computer might go about it, uh, uh, recognising from a vision system. Now here we have a pad, and the pad can sense the position of that pen, and we can reproduce the movements of the pen on uh, this grid on the screen here. What I've done is program into the computer um, the shapes corresponding to the numbers 0 to 9, and we're going to try and see if the computer can recognise uh, the number that you draw on that pad. Well, I'm going to draw a 6. Let's try that. Now, whilst you're doing that, um, the way that we're going to uh, try and get the computer to find out what you're drawing is to tell it to look for three white uh, squares in a row down or across. There are, in fact, a number of these threes, I've called them triples, uh, in the picture. Um, so let's see how the computer manages to uh, get on with that shape. And it says there are seven of these triples in your drawing, and it's now trying to match these up against uh, the drawings I've already given it. Now, we're only looking here for one particular feature. It's like uh, looking at a, an animal in the real world. If it has a trunk, we can recognise it as an elephant. But um, to make a good programme of this, we should really look for a number of features, like curves or enclosed spaces. And, in fact, it's got it wrong because it was just trying to use one feature. So another approach we could try is to get it to do pattern matching. That is, we use this pattern that it's got as a template and we see how many black squares match one for one and how many white squares match one for one. So let's give it another go and try that approach to the problem. And here we are, we can see down here the number of matches that it's finding. This is relatively low definition in real terms. It would be a very much finer definition than that. Oh yes, on a vision system we'd have thousands of these uh, dots on the screen. And it's nearly finished. And, in fact, it has got it right. It said that you drew a six. That's very good, even though that doesn't look very much like a six. There are some parts missing. It's not very Yes, it's the, it's the nearest match it could find, though. But there is a drawback with this pattern-matching approach. Um, let me show you. 
that you can immediately recognize as the letter R. But for the computer, it has, first of all, to work out which way round the shape is. It's got to move it into the center of its vision, like that. And it's also got to deal in the real world with three dimensions, so it has to deal with that kind of, of difficulty as well. And that's where we'd use, say, two cameras to produce um, three-dimensional vision and then get the computer to work on that, which gets very much more complicated. And there's another problem as well. Um, you're looking at this letter, and you can um, isolate it away from the background behind. And again, we have to get the computer to deal with that. I'll put up on the screen now um, typically the kind of thing that a computer vision system might uh, um, have to analyze. It's a large number of dots on the screen. And in there, we have uh, an image which we have to isolate from the background. So we give the uh, computer some arbitrary rules. For instance, we can say to it, any single dots like that, remove, or any two dots together, remove those, like that. And then we could say, well, any three dots in a group like that, remove those. And you can see we're beginning to get the image out. And then we could say to it, well, any four dots like that, remove those. Gradually, you can see that the image is coming out of the background, and then the computer can get on with working out what that um, image represents. That's very clever. We saw a system recently that was actually trying to recognize real objects. This image recognition system runs on an ordinary 8-bit microcomputer. Objects are put under the camera and an image is fed into the computer system. The camera itself is rather unusual. Instead of the normal television camera, this one is made from a single random access memory chip with its top removed. Light reflected from the object is turned into an electrical pattern on the surface of the chip. The software can store up to eight of these patterns. It can detect a number of distinguishing features for each one and tell whether it's round or square, what the area and perimeter is, whether it has any holes, and finally, how many objects actually make up the pattern. Once the system has learnt the features of a set of objects and something is placed under the camera, the software can be asked if it recognises it. The software does this by using the stored features for each of the known objects as a template and trying to superimpose each one over the new pattern to see if it fits. If one of the templates match, then the software reports that the object is recognised. Because the objects are unlikely to be put down in exactly the same position, the software can rotate the template to try it at a number of angles, but it can't handle a change in plane. So if a known object is tilted in front of the camera, the pattern produced is very dissimilar to the known features, and the system sees it as an entirely new shape. Stockbroker. Dialing. Good afternoon. This is your stockbroker. Please enter your access code. One. Two. Three. Did you say? One. Two. Three. Yes. One moment, please. Hello, Mac. You hold 2,000 shares in Hype Micro and total losses today have been £750. Oh. Would you like to leave a message for your broker? Yes. Please start your message after the tone. Tell him to get a grip. Would you like to hear your message? Yes. Tell him to get a grip. Is this message OK? Yes. Your message has been sent. Thank you for ringing. Goodbye, Mac. Goodbye. Well, this is a professional voice recognition and voice synthesis unit, and it really is quite complex in the way it handles my voice. In fact, I only had to record those words it recognised once only. Ian, what are the principles behind its operation? 
Well, it's using the same kind of ideas that we saw before. It's taking the volume of your voice and the frequencies in the sounds that you're making, and it's trying to match those against templates, and it's trying to pick out features. Um, I can show you uh, the idea on, on this computer here. We've got um, a microphone attached to the computer, and this one is just simply measuring the loudness of my voice. And what I'm going to do is to teach it uh, a word. I'm going to give it some samples of a particular word. Reverse. 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 And there it's got a picture of that word, and it's now making up an average out of those four um, and turning it into a template of that word. Now, I've already recorded um, some other words, um, and if I load those up um, now, uh, we'll see if it can pick out one of those uh, words that I've already recorded. We've got forward, reverse, stop, and pick up, words we might use to control a robot. So let's try. Pick up. And here comes the pattern. And now that pattern is overlaid onto the previous templates. And what the computer is now going to do is to measure the difference between uh, the word that I've just given it and the templates it already has in its memory. And the first one you can see forward, 69% accurate, 70% for reverse. Stop is 73. And pick up the one that I actually gave it. Let's see how it does. 86% there, and that's the one it recognises. Well, of course, that's only measuring one thing. This professional unit is measuring several. Let's see if you can recognise your voice. Why don't you try it? Stockbroker. Sorry, please repeat that. Stockbroker. Dialing. So it really does work. We're beginning to see how computers can recognise a limited vocabulary. They can be taught to speak phrases. They can begin to extract information from images they see through a television camera. And in some sort of way, every sense a human has can be copied, and even some they don't have. Putting all this together and being able to understand what's going on and take actions accordingly is full of unexpected difficulties. What we really want is to be able to do some of the things that sort of instinctively happen to you. You can do a scene analysis very easily. You can uh, look at a, someone turning around the corner three blocks away, and you just see the back of his head, and you know who it is. Now, that sort of intelligence is what we want. We've, we've got great pictures. You know, there's the camera. But we can't interpret what we're seeing. And we'll have to do things like probably change our processing, get away with von, von, von Neumann uh, mathematics, go to parallel processing, pipeline processing, and be able to do the uh, tremendous amount of number crunching necessary to and create new algorithms. And that's all part of the artificial intelligence scene. To a psychologist, artificial intelligence is using computers to give an insight into how humans reason and behave and to attempt to understand what we know as intelligence. To computer scientists, it means using a computer to behave as an intelligent human would under the same circumstances. To some extent, that's possible today. And here's our dummy that Steve's linked to a computer, and I can control it by talking to it. Wink. Smile. Surprise. Well, some people may think of that as intelligent behaviour, but it seems pretty stupid to me. What do you think, dummy? I've been told to say goodbye from me. Well, that's all for now, so it's goodbye from him and it's goodbye from me.